Good morning, KBC. Uh, glad that you're uh, joining us this morning. And uh, we're just going to give it a few minutes to uh, allow people to get on, but uh, good morning. And uh, just wondered how everyone is doing this morning. And uh, we're into, I think, 11 weeks of our shutdown. And uh, just praying that everyone is uh, doing well and managing well. And uh, is uh, staying ahead of things and staying healthy. Uh, but feel free to uh, to share if you've got things going on or um, some things you've been able to accomplish or things that we can be praying for. Uh, good morning, Nick. Nice deck. Looking forward to partying on that. Hello, Steve. <laughs> nice deck. Steve and Nick have both been working on some decks this week. Uh, Again, good morning, and uh, we're glad that you're joining. We're just going to give a few moments to uh, allow people to jump on before our devotion this morning. So far, the common theme is decks. Christy and I were starting to restain our deck this past week, so. Uh, but it's been nice to have some, um, some great weather and uh, feeling a little bit more like summer out there. And uh, certainly not as cold, and uh, hopefully you've been able to get out as family to enjoy uh, some of the nicer weather uh, that we've had this week and enjoyed this week. And again, we uh, continue to miss being together as a church, and uh, we're looking forward to that day uh, where the restrictions will be uh, lessened a bit, and we'll be able to um, at least get back to some sort of uh, a group setting, um, but until that day comes, um, we're just so happy that uh, you're able to join us on uh, these Facebook Live uh, devotional times on Sunday mornings. Uh, and look forward to, we're going to be, in the coming weeks, we're going to be trying to add a little bit more to these um, Sunday mornings, so uh, look forward to that. Um, Sam and our worship team have been working on uh, doing some music that hopefully we'll be able to see in a couple of weeks. But again, we're glad that everyone uh, is joining us this morning. Good morning uh, to the Patnos, John and Tamara and family. Glad that you guys are joining us today. And hello, uh, LaFangs. Hope you guys are having a good week. Good morning, Tim. So we'll get another minute or so, and uh, then we'll jump into our uh, devotion this morning. And uh, just make sure that for those that are KBC family, that uh, you take a look at uh, the weekly email that goes out to make sure that you're part of um, all those different uh, opportunities for um, adult studies, prayer uh, for the kids and for the youth. And just a reminder that on Tuesday night, uh, during our Zoom chat, we're going to be doing um, a time of communion. Um, so just make sure that you come prepared um, for that. But that'll be Tuesday night um, at 8 o'clock. We'll do a little bit of a discussion time. Uh, but then we will um, spend some time um, at the end of that Zoom call um, remembering uh, Jesus Christ and his uh, sacrifice for us as we take part in communion together as a church. So just you make sure that you're going to be, want to be part of that. Um, well, let's get going. And again, thank you for those that are able to join us this morning. And uh, as always, if you could um, like this post and share it, um, and even write some comments, uh, that'd be fantastic. And we'll just get the word out uh, and the message out to a little bit more of our feeds. Uh, but this morning's um, topic is wisdom for the days ahead. We're going to be looking at Titus uh, chapter 3, um, verse 1 to 11. And uh, so really, when we, we look at this past week, uh, we have officially entered the first stage of our province's plan uh, to reopen our communities. Um, this included adding to the list of those providing essential services, um, a slate of retail and service-based businesses, uh, that can meet certain criteria. So among the amenities were some outdoor community spaces, 
um, golf courses for those that enjoy golfing, um, trailer parks, campgrounds, and a number of different uh, areas. But uh, we're starting to see the first stages of um, things being released and, and some of the bands um, coming off. Um, though we've found out that still groups of five or more people are still technically banned from um, at least meeting for the coming weeks, though uh, just over a week ago, the Premier seemed to leave the door open to enjoy an outdoor barbecue with extended family members, provided you stay smart about it. So I don't know if that's an official um, go ahead, but uh, you know we need to be remaining uh, diligent and uh, just protecting ourselves. But the one area that surprisingly was um, really left out from um, any announcements uh, during this kind of this first stage of opening um, was any mention of religious gatherings. Uh, now later on, um, I believe it was early this week, um, there was the talk of, of maybe allowing uh, drive-in churches. Um, we're not sure what that really looks like yet. Um, but realistically, that religious gatherings have been kind of left out of most of the discussion. Um, you know, these last two months, really very little have been said about what the church um, could come to expect in the coming weeks and months about um, what it will look like to get together. And you can imagine that within the religious community, um, this idea of the church's meeting together again and what that will look like and when it will happen and how many people will be allowed um, has really brought up a lot of discussion, debate, and um, even disagreement within the religious communities. Um, churches right across the spectrum are trying to figure out how to fulfill the Great Commission and the Great Commandment and, and how to do this with out being able to really meet with people physically outside of immediate families. And really the reaction to this whole uncertainty has been very widespread. From those who are taking a more cautious approach, okay to follow the recommendations of our government leaders, to those who are demanding that restrictions on churches be lifted um, even as early as the beginning of June, so that churches can begin meeting together. And some churches are even calling on uh, Christians in Ontario um, to protest uh, this church ban or this church exile that we're facing. And I'll have to be, admit that I've, I've read a lot of these. Um, a lot of these come through my social media um, feeds because I'm connected with a lot of pastors. And with each article, with each post, and with each email that seeks to take one side over the other, um, my heart seems to be torn. I, I miss meeting together as a church, and I wish things would return to uh, normal. But I also believe that this is a unique time, and like the period of the Babylonian exile, we might, as the church, need to set aside some of our rights as the people of God for this time in order to do our part to fight this virus. So the question I want to kind of navigate through this morning is this. How do we navigate this time where we seem to be stuck in this void between what we desire to do as the church, and that's be together, and what we're able to do, and that's really online stuff. Um, the passage we're going to be looking at is Titus chapter 3, verse 1 to 11. And this is a a letter that was written uh, to Titus, who was a young pastor um, who was leading the church on the Isle of Crete. It's very much a, kind of a similar story to, to Timothy and just his, um, how young he was and, and really the responsibility to lead a church that he had. And this was a letter written to Titus by the Apostle Paul. And really the purpose of this letter was to give some practical instructions um, for the church in some key areas that this particular church was struggling through. And the focus of the chapter of what I want to look at and how Paul really ends off uh, this letter is how we as Christians are to maintain a positive uh, witness within our community. And I want to read you the passage. Again, it's Titus uh, chapter 3, verse 1 to 11. 
And it says this, remind them to be submissive to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by the by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And then verse 8 says, The saying is trustworthy, and I want to want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. For as, um, as for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice and having nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful and he is self-condemned. So before we get into the what it looks like and the wisdom that um, Paul is addressing and how we as believers um, ought to live uh, amongst our community, uh, we first need to answer the question of why. why. Why does this matter? Why should we go out of our way to live such radical lives amongst those around us? So we want to look back at verse 3. And it's meant to serve as a reminder um, to, to those who were the recipients of this letter about who they used to be, or in a few words, that they were just like whom they're struggling to follow. It says here in verse 3, we, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating others. That's who they used to be, and quite honestly, that's who we used to be. So what changed? Well, God showed up in their lives. And though they didn't deserve his goodness, love, grace, mercy, um, and could never hope to earn a right standing before him, he saved them anyway through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he has done the same for many of us that will be viewing this video. He's washed us. He's cleansed us, he's renewed us spiritually, and he's set our hearts on the hope of eternity through the work of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus stands as the example of what it means to love those who are unlovable, to show mercy and grace to those who are undeserving. And as followers of Jesus, we must seek to replicate his witness uh, in us to the witness that we have as the church to those in our communities to those in leadership over us. See, when we live the lives characterized of the things that we're going to talk about um, now, in doing these things, we are living out practically to our world the example that Jesus Christ set for us. We're hopefully giving our world a picture of who Jesus Christ is and, and how important he is to us and, and how much he loves us. So what does this look like? Um, what is the wisdom in life that Paul um, tells Timothy to pass on to the church? Well, there's, there's four things, really five things I want to mention. The first is this, this command to be submissive. And what Paul's talking about is he's making a, um, a command or he's, he's instructing the church to be submissive. Well, who? To be submissive, well, to be submissive to the rulers and the authorities um, that they are under. Those are secular um, government officials. Paul also talks about this in um, Romans, and he also talks about this in Peter. And what it means to be submissive is, in this context, it means that as long as it doesn't directly go against God's clear instructions 
or it doesn't pull our focus off God as our primor, primary um, goal and, and our primary love, that we are to seek to be obedient to our government leaders, even if we don't like or agree with their mandates. That's why if the party that you vote for doesn't get in, you're not left off the hook to follow the recommendations of the party that did get in. Uh, this has become one of the main struggles during this exile of the church. As we see businesses open up all around us, yet our church buildings stay closed. But I struggle with articles like the one I read this past week from an Ontario pastor, which was outlining 50 reasons why Christians should protest um, the shutdown of churches. Um, yes, it, it's been hard on us all. And we would all love to be together as the church. But our leaders have said otherwise. And our leaders, I don't believe at this point, are out to attack the church. Um, but they're trying to lead us through and guide us through this critical time um, to fight this virus. So some questions to ask to help in our response to this idea of submission and to see if it falls into a place where we can submit are these. The first question I would ask is, are these restrictions reasonable? And for how long will they remain reasonable? If everything, if everything um, else was open but churches, then I think it would be logical to say that maybe there's an ulterior motive. Maybe there's something else going on where, yes, churches are um, becoming the focus of a direct attack, but we're not there yet. Um, this isn't a government's um, who are trying to put down squash churches. But really, when we look at it, there, there's no um, public gatherings that are allowed at this point in time. And so that's a question that we need to ask and struggle through. And maybe in time that um, our answer to that question of reasonable um, restrictions may, be, may change. Another question I would have us ask is, do our leaders' directives go against the direct instructions of God's word? Yes, we as a church are mandated to not get into the habit of skipping out in meeting together. But what we are facing is, is not by choice. And there are opportunities to still make sure that we connect as a church. Yes, online ministry is not ideal. And it should not replace the physical meeting of the church when that becomes available again to us. But we might need and just trust that during this time, we're going to have to sacrifice a little bit um, in order to get through this. So that's the idea of submission. The second thing that Paul instructs Titus to share with the church is the idea of um, to not speak evil of anyone. And this is about speaking ill about um, or even making passing assumptions of others when they are not there to defend or clarify their intentions. Uh, this would be a form of gossip. And the greatest area, I think, of temptation right now for gossip of or, or speaking um, wrongly of someone else, speaking evil of someone else, is in the area of social media. It is the one place where it seems people think and believe that they have the freedom to say anything they want um, without recourse. And it, and it they, they think it's anonymous. But might I urge you to be careful with what you post and even careful what you repost. If you have an issue with someone, uh, pick up the phone, um, send a direct message, but don't post a negative comments um, for the world to see. It doesn't do the relationship any good, and it certainly doesn't do us any good in our um, in our example um, to the world around us. If anything, it really makes the church seem petty and Christians seem petty and often exactly what many people think of the church already. The third thing is this. It says avoid quarreling. I don't know if you've ever met someone who enjoys arguing just for the sake of arguing. 
And please, if you write comments, no names. Uh, but have you noticed how when you have someone when you meet someone or, or engage with someone who just wants to argue for the sake of arguing, how that relationship or how their attitude uh, and their actions just seem to suck the life out of those closest to them? See, Christians, in our relationship with one another, we should be seeking to be a breath of life to others and, and, and not suck life out of the relationships. See, we do this by actively seeking to be agents of peace rather than active in conflict, encouragers rather than haters. This does not mean that we should be a bunch of pushovers or that we avoid conflict. Unfortunately, that's probably the negative of this. But we are to be people who are calm, not given to verbal sparring for the sake of winning an argument. Instead, we are to be those who have the goal of working towards a solution. And arguing for the sake of arguing or quarreling versus working and discussing to a solution are totally two different things. Again, we are reminded of the ugliness of social media where those seeking to pick a fight um, on social media platforms are a dime a dozen. Um, they, ought to be, they ought not to characterize us as believers. And in saying this, and in, in really in sharing even a bit of the struggle that I face in um, trying to navigate many different viewpoints um, about what the church should be doing in this time and when we should be getting back together. Um, I've caught myself a couple times uh, wanting to post comments and not, but I just want to say that I do appreciate those in our church circles who have been given um, the, the opportunity and the place to dialogue with some of our government officials in regards to the situation that the church is currently facing. There's a number of pastors who have had the opportunity to to enter into dialogue and enter into discussion with um, some of our leaders just about trying to ask the questions and, and to get a little bit of a feedback of um, where things might be going and what the church might to, might um, expect in the coming days. And I appreciate these individuals and, and we need to be praying for them that they might have an attitude of peace in their discussions rather than an attitude of aggression, and I, unfortunately I've seen both take place. The last thing I want to mention in these words of wisdom that Paul is giving Timothy in, in order to help navigate relationships with government officials, but also relationships with uh, Christians within their communities, this um, instruction to, to do so or, or, or to be gentle and humble in our relationships and our conversations interactions. See, we live in a world where we have bought into the lie that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Meaning that if you want to get noticed, if you want to have your voice heard, you need to be more aggressive and shout a lot louder than the next person. But is this the attitude that Paul has given to us? Well, if anything, it's very much the opposite. We are called to treat others with gentleness, both in our words and as well as in our actions. We're to have a, an attitude of humbleness where we consider the needs and even the value of others um, as more important or before ourselves. In a very real sense, this attitude is one of the driving factors be, behind our willingness to submit to those in government over us and why we choose to um, seek peace rather than aggression in our dealings with others. We are to be um, marked by gentleness and by being humble um, in our community around us. So these are the instructions that were given and directed to the church as they were um, told and, and basically um, given wisdom on how to, to deal with those in their community and how to make sure that they still... Um, really set the example of Christ. See, our goal is, is that when we live in our, in our communities, when we interact with those around us, and people know that we're believers, we want people to be attracted to our Savior. 
We don't want people to look at the way we treat others, the words we use, the, the nature, the, the character that we have, and, and determine that if we're the example of a Christian, then we'd rather not be one. Um, we want to live lives that are attractive so that people are attractive to our Savior. And really when we look at this, this, this should be our attitude. Um, but there's one thing I also want to mention, and this is something that um, Paul talks about after the, the segment where he kind of reminds us of who we are in Christ and what Christ has done for us. And it adds a little bit extra wisdom to things. And, and really it was discussing um, Christians' interaction with um, false prophets within their ranks. But I think the words hold true to something else as well. And I want to read it again, and it's um, Titus chapter 3, verse 9 to 11. This is what Paul ends this section off. He says, But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division um, after a warning, him once and then twice, have nothing to do with him um, anymore, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful and he is uh, self-condemned. Here's the question I have. Why is it that Christians seem to be so constantly caught up in the spread of foolish controversies and things that are meant to divide, especially as it has to do with COVID-19? Um, some of the things that I see Christians repost um, are nothing more than conspiracy theories. And it seems that maybe in our longing to be together, maybe in our longing to have things return to normal, um, we feel the need to propagate things that are false, um, things that are just wives' tales, that are just conspiracy theories and controversies. Can I urge us not to get sucked into this garbage um, by proliferating things that aren't true and and these are on the in, on the increase this day as everybody's looking for some sense that we're working our way through this um, see it's hurting our witness and it's been amazed that the even in the past few months how easily Christians get sucked into the false information that's floating around and then actively repeating it or promoting these conspiracy theories. Um, when we do so, we're again, we're just feeding into the world's perception of us that we're just a bunch of kooks. Um, be careful what you believe as truth. I tested it against scripture. I tested it against the authorities. Um, and be really, really careful in what you choose um, to share and to repost um, for the world to see. So here's my prayer as we kind of conclude this morning. My prayer and my encouragement to each one of us um, is, is that we would be wise. We would be wise in our actions. We would be wise in our attitudes. And we would be wise in our comments um, as well as in our relationships with others. So we can be confident in our relationship with Christ. Um, that's where our confidence comes from. That's where our security comes from. Um, as bad as things might get, now we have a foundation in Jesus Christ that our sins are forgiven, that in him we have life, in him we have freedom from sin, uh, and in him we have a promised inheritance um, and eternal life. And, and, and so we can be confident in him. And we don't need to be foolish. And let's be a good representation of our Savior to those around us. Um, we've talked about it a lot where there seems to be a lot more conversations. I know those that have been joining us on, on Thursdays talking about um, this idea of how to be a good neighbor are, are sharing lots of stories about us being able to connect with um, those in our communities. And so as we do this, let's be good representations of Jesus Christ. Um, let's 
be able to show them um, the solid foundation that we have, um, especially during these times of uncertainty, so that as they look at our lives, as they see how we live, how we treat them, that they might be attracted to our Savior. Um, and let's continue to pray that God would have his hand on our leaders, both those in the Christian circles and those in the secular circles, that God would use them to guide us through these uncertain days. Um, so hopefully just some words of wisdom um, as we do our best to navigate as believers um, through these times of uncertainty and as we seek to be a good examples um, for Jesus Christ. And uh, so I, I would just pray that you would um, seek wisdom, uh, that you would seek to be wise in your actions, in your words, in your attitudes, in your relationships, um, and that in doing so, uh, people might be attracted to Jesus Christ, the Savior that so many of us profess. Uh, so with that, let me just close our time in a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we just, again, thank you for today. And we know in this time of uncertainty, um, there is certainly um, a lack of wisdom um, from so many different um, spheres and from so many different um, sources. And I, I pray, Lord, that you would help us as believers to be wise, to be wise in our actions. And that would include our willingness to submit to our government for this time um, in not meeting together into giving up that, that freedom that we have. You know, wisdom in how we talk to one another, how we, in not getting into quarrels, in, in not getting caught up into gossip, especially on social media platforms, um, in our relationships of being those that would be considered and seen as gentle and humble. And, and Father, also we pray that you would help us to not get caught up in these conspiracy theories that are going on around us. Um, yes, we are looking for the way out. We're looking for that, that snapshot, that light at the end of the tunnel that there is hope. And ultimately, we know that our hope is in you, and, and that should be enough. So help us just to be careful of what we um, cling on to as truth and what we choose to repost um, Lord, help us to be wise in, in those decisions we make. And, and Father, our, our goal, um, our, our calling is that as we live in the world around us, as we interact with those in our community, with those that are, have been given authority over us for this time, um, Lord, our deep desire is that when they interact with us as believers, as your church, Lord, that they would see the beauty of Christ um, and that they would be drawn to him and not that we would give Jesus a bad name through foolish actions. So help us in that. And uh, Father, just help us to live with wisdom. And uh, we, again, just thank you for this time together. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, next week, we're going to be finishing off our series um, talking about the church in exile. And uh, we're going to be looking at just some wisdom in when things release and we're able to get back um, to meeting together, at least in um, some way or another. We want to look at really just the wisdom and, and how do we return to um being the, the church that we once knew um, in, in ways that are wise. And uh, so we're going to talk about that and just kind of unpack that a little bit next week. So hope you'll join us. But again, um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're glad that you're here. It's so, so great to be able to interact with a number. And uh, we hope that uh, we will see you um, on some of our calls this week. And just a reminder that we are doing communion um, at 8 o'clock on our Zoom call. Um, 
on Tuesday. And uh, if you need the information, the, the link to that call is available in the weekly uh, KBC uh, bulletin. So God bless. Have a great uh, rest of your day. Uh, we're praying for you and uh, I release you to live lives uh, that are wise and attractive for our Savior in this world. Uh, God bless and have a great day.